الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to a new episode of Mercy to the Worlds صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم sent another message to Al-Mundhir ibn Sawi, and he was the ruler of Bahrain. And Bahrain is not the country that we know of, the small island in the Arabian Gulf. Bahrain at the time of the Prophet ﷺ was the whole eastern province of Arabia. So whatever was east of the center of Arabia used to be called Bahrain. And he sent to him his messenger, Al-Ala ibn al-Hadrami, who also introduced Islam to him and asked him to accept Islam. Another companion, Salit ibn Amr, may Allah be pleased with him, was sent to Hawdha ibn Ali, and he was the leader, leader of Yamama. And Hawdha accepted, in a sense, Islam, but not because of Islam, he wanted to share the Prophet Sallallahu kingdom. And the Prophet Sallallahu rejected his request because this was not a kingdom owned by the Prophet Sallallahu and he was not a ruler or an empire or an emperor of an empire. He was simply the messenger and the servant of Allah. So he had a bad intention. He had, bad, he had worldly intention. And in, in Islam, as we know from the hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab, all deeds depend on the intentions. So if you accept Islam and your intention is not for the sake of Allah, your Islam is not accepted. And a person would die on disbelief if this is the case. And that is why all hypocrites are not Muslims. They claim to be Muslims but their intentions are not sincere and pure, and that is why it is not accepted from them. And the Prophet ﷺ also told us that from Yamama, there will be someone who claims that he is a prophet. And of course, we know that is Abu Musaylima al kadhab Abu Musaylima, the liar, who at first pretended to be a messenger and he said funny words claiming that these are uh, revelations from Allah. And he named himself Rahman Al-Yamama. And Rahman, of course, is yes. one of the names of Allah, yes. the Almighty. And we know the fierce battles that took place after, immediately after the death of the Prophet ﷺ between the Muslims and between this great and big liar. Also the Prophet ﷺ sent to Al-Harith ibn Abi Shamar Al-Ghassani and he was the ruler of Damascus and the regions around them. He sent to him the companion Shuja ibn Wahb. And when this ruler saw the letter of the Prophet ﷺ, he was outraged. Again, it's arrogance all over. And he was astonished. He said that this man wants me to give him my kingdom. Who does he think he is? And he started to gather his army to go and invade Medina. But being a follower of the ruler of the Romans at the time, Herakl, he 
sent for him asking him for his permission and what do you think that the answer came the answer was negative you are not to go to this man because Hiraqal himself almost accepted Islam and he knew that he was the messenger of Allah so he did not allow him allow him to go to Medina and he said really strong things about the issue which made this man Al Harith ibn Abi Shamar made him twist in his attitude. He brought Shuja'a, may Allah be pleased with him. He honored him, he gave him gifts, he told him nice things. Because at the very first, when he attended his court, the, the moment he saw the letter, he threw it and was frustrated and was agitated. He wanted to go and invade Medina immediately. But after the reply came from Herakl, the, the leader of the Romans, he calmed down and he came back to his senses and he honored the messenger and the message of the Prophet. Sheikh, I heard that Herakl was about to accept Islam, but the people around him uh, convinced him to reject Islam. Is that true? No, 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 this is not true. He was about to accept Islam. They did not convince him. They did not accept this matter from the very start. So when he showed them and told them about Islam, they all started to shout and tremble and they wanted to attack him. So he had a choice, either to accept Islam and migrate to Medina and leave all this wealth and kingdom behind him or to stay as he is, rejecting Islam. And this is what he decided. And that is why in one of the narrations, the Prophet Sallallahu said that he was in a sense holding to his throne rather than holding to Islam. He would not give away his kingdom to or for the sake of Islam. Another companion of the Prophet and this is a bit funny and strange. This companion was sent to the head of the kingdom of Oman and Oman as we know is to the south of Arabia and Oman at the time meant that it was Oman and Hadramaut the southern part of Yemen this was all called Oman and it was ruled by a, a, a man called Jafar and his brother Abd both of them but the king was Jafar himself and the Prophet sent them a, a companion of his who stayed there for a while convincing them of accepting the Prophet's call and accepting Islam. Uh, some narrations said, say that they accepted Islam after long trials. The man that the Prophet ﷺ sent as a messenger of his was Amr ibn al-As. And the funny thing is, that Amr ibn al-As himself was sent to a Najashi in Abyssinia long ago, but for a complete different mission. His, his mission about 10 or, or 12 or 14 years ago, about 10 years ago that is, was to convince a Najashi of Abyssinia to send the Muslims back with Amr ibn al-As. Back to Medina, back to Mecca. Back to Mecca, because at the time Amr ibn As was a polytheist, was a pagan. So he went there, he bribed the courtsmen of a Najashi, gave them gifts, and convinced them to stand by his side. When he was allowed to speak in the presence of the Najashi, he told him that these are youngsters and they are from our people. And we know what's wrong with them. They said bad things about our gods and we are requesting you to send them back with us. And the courtsmen backed him up and told the Najashi that he's saying something that is reasonable. The ministers, the prime ministers and so on. They all backed Amr's allegation and they requested the Najashi 
to dispose of these people and to send them back to their people because they know them best. Najashi would not accept this until he heard from the other side. And this is a very important thing. Whenever one comes to you in complaint, do not listen to him without listening to the other party. And so many times we get calls from brothers who are complaining from their wives and from sisters who are complaining from their husbands. If you listen to one party and not listen to the other, you would say that the right is always with the one who you listen to. But if you listen to the sister, you would say that the husband has to be hanged. If, if what she's saying is true, the brother has to be hanged. And if you listen to the husband, you say, well, I changed my mind. The sister should be chopped off. The, her head should be chopped off. And when you put them together and listen to them both talking, you find that 50% is true and 50% here is true and the rest is all false. And Najashi did what any just and fair ruler would do. He said that I would not reject those who came to me and sought asylum in my country until I listened to what they say. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib came, presented Islam to them, and, and Najashi was pleased with what he heard and saw no threat to the security of his country, so he allowed them to stay. The following day, Amr ibn al-As said that I came up with an idea that would annihilate them from uh, uh, Abyssinia. And he went to the Najashi and told him that these people that you are supporting, they think badly about Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. Ask them what they say about him. And Ja'far ibn Abi Talib did not say anything except was, that was mentioned in the Quran. He told him that we believe in the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ and that he is among the top five messengers of Allah, Ulul Azm, the, 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 the messengers of power and strength, and that he was miraculously born to Maryam without a father. But we do not believe that he is a God or a son of a God. He is a human being. And the Najashi said that this is what the Bible had said and this is exactly what Jesus Christ is. I believe we have a short break. Stay tuned. Inshallah, we will be back. <laughs> Reviewing the second rule of al mim al sakina That is the letter Mim. So if the first Mim is non-vowel or sakina followed by a vowel Mim. So I will merge the first in the letter and I will pronounce them as one. وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ And we spoke abundantly on the virtues of seeking refuge with Allah from the outcast Satan. Especially for the first reciter, he's got to recite it out loud. والسماء ذات البروج أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فإذا جاءت الصاخة وإذا النفوس زوجت Make sure it's ضمة وإذا النو وإذا النفوس Thank you for joining us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. So Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with him. Ten years ago, he was a pagan with a polytheist, attacking Islam, trying his best to undermine the efforts of Muslims to practice the religion 
without any fear or oppression. And now he is the ambassador of the Prophet ﷺ to the king of Oman, asking him to come into Islam. SubhanAllah, how people change to the positive and to the, their own welfare with the grace of Allah the Almighty. And there were other messengers and other companions of the Prophet ﷺ sent elsewhere. All of this was an attempt from the, from the Prophet ﷺ to call these dignitaries to Islam and also to relieve himself from the responsibility because it is every individual's responsibility to call others to Islam. Now, you can call them straight ahead and present them with a, a, a straightforward request like the Prophet ﷺ did because everyone heard about Islam. It was almost 20 years old in Arabia at that time. So they all had information about Islam. There are other ways that people can call others to Islam. You can call Islam through your behavior. You can call Islam through giving handouts, tape, cassettes. You can call people to Islam through dialogue, not necessarily debates. So, Sheikh, that mean we will be asked about the people who live in uh, Europe and America in this view? No, Allah Azza wa will not ask you about every individual person, Tom, Dick, or Harry, why didn't you deliver the message to them? But Allah the Almighty will ask you about those who were next to you. It is a shame that a lot of us know non-Muslims and not putting the effort just to call them once to Islam. The Prophet ﷺ gave us the best example. He had a young Jew neighbor and also sometimes he used to serve the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet, he is a young boy. The Prophet ﷺ once heard that the boy was ill. Now, the head of state, the messenger of Allah himself went to visit this Jew, this child, this boy. And he went there, he visited him as, a, pay, as a, a sick person and then took the opportunity to call him to Islam. So our Prophet wasallam introduced Islam to the boy asking him to accept Islam. The boy looked at his father asking him for permission because he, he, he's a young boy. So the father, the Jew himself, told his son, obey Abel Qasim. And Abel Qasim one is of one of the Prophet Sallallahu name, nicknames. And Abu means the father. So the father, one of his sons was Al Qasim. So he said, Ati' Aba Al Qasim. And the boy accepted Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out of the house happy. And he said that all praise be to Allah the Almighty who salvaged and saved this man, this boy from hell because of my call to him to Islam. This means that we have to try our best to call non-Muslims to Islam. But again, this depends on the situation. Some people would not accept being directly invited to Islam. And others may accept Islam through analyzing your own conduct and behavior. What about if I don't have the ability to give da'wah to them, the information about Christianity and Islam as well? If that, it's, yeah. it's, it's quite wrong to try and acquire all the knowledge and then afterwards preach Islam or call people to Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said once, May Allah Azza wa Jal put youth and beauty in the face of a person who delivers only one verse of the Quran. Only one verse. So no matter what level your knowledge is, your ability to deliver 
monotheism to deliver the testimony is by itself enough. And never underestimate your knowledge and ability to call people to Islam. Because if this is one of the steps of Satan that we are prevented from following, he would always come to you and say, well, you don't have enough knowledge in this area. What about if they ask you about this? So let's wait five or, or six months more so that you can acquire the knowledge. And then he goes on to tafsir, the commentary of the Quran. You don't know every single verse of the Quran. And then he goes to the hadith. You don't know the hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ, how authentic they are or how weak and what uh, uh, is the meaning of each one of them. And he goes on and on and on. He would find people like this, student of knowledge, and I know few of them, who would be put into isolation of their own choice, reading, researching, f uh, writing, acquiring knowledge without benefiting others. And they live in time of away from the reality of the people. Yes, and, and, and they're among us. Mm. And you'd find people studying for five or ten years. MashaAllah, they have much knowledge. But when you ask them, what have you done with this knowledge? Nothing. And at the same time, you would probably find people who have far less knowledge than the other one, the other person, yet they are roaming the countries, calling these to da'wah, calling these to Islam, showing people what they know, though they don't have much knowledge. Now, both are not that correct in the sense that you should have a certain level or, or, or amount of knowledge to be able to call people to Islam. And once you have this knowledge, it's different calling people to Islam than giving verdicts, giving verdicts and fatwa and teaching. It's, it's a different stage. So you can be a person who calls others to Islam by giving handouts, by giving cassettes, by giving uh, a video, uh, video tapes, or by giving even CDs. And, and this is peanuts. And it's, it's for free almost. But you never realize the effect and impact it has on others. Doing this does not mean that you have become a scholar or a person that can deliver fatwa and uh, different verdicts on different Islamic issues. The Prophet ﷺ did his best to call everyone to Islam so that on the Day of Judgment, no one would have an excuse. No one would come before Allah the Almighty and say, that I didn't know that there was a messenger of Islam. I didn't know that Islam existed. I didn't know that you wanted us to follow the Quran. By the Prophet ﷺ spreading his messengers all over the country, this left no excuse to anyone. And the authentic hadith states that the Prophet ﷺ said, By Allah whom my soul is in his hands. No Jew or Christian hears about me and my message and does not believe in me, by Allah, he will be thrown into hell. And this is a severe warning and a prophecy from a Prophet ﷺ. To all those Jews and Christians, if you hear about the message of the Prophet ﷺ, you have to cross-examine it because you will be questioned on the day of judgment for not following it. And it's easier for the Christians to accept Islam than it is for the Jews. And the Christians themselves can evaluate the situation and understand our position as Muslims. Because when Jesus Christ came, he was met by the Jews as the Christians met our Prophet ﷺ, and that, that was rejection. The Jews did not accept Jesus Christ, and the Christians do not accept Muhammad ﷺ. The Jews did not accept the New Testament, the Gospel, the Injil, and the Christians did not accept the Quran. So they can appreciate our position and they can evaluate the situation much better than 
the Jews. They have to be unbiased. They have to be objective in studying Islam. And they will find that 99% of what Islam preaches and teaches goes along fine and well with their nature. 1%, most likely, that they would not be easy with simply because they either could not understand the background of, the, of this 1% or because they themselves are indulged and engaged with sins that are against Christianity and against Islam. So they do, they're not willing to let go of it because of their own evil uh, uh, desires. But if they were objective, they would definitely accept Islam. Having gone through all this, the Prophet ﷺ had one front secured, and that was the front of the polytheist of Quraysh. So he had two fronts left, the front of the tribes of Najd, Ghatafan, and so on, and the remaining Jews in the peninsula. And they were all gathered in their stronghold of Khaybar. And Khaybar was a village about a hundred plus kilometers to the northwest of Medina. Medina. The Prophet وسلم, on the seventh year of Hijrah decided to go and launch his offensive against the village of Khaybar. The Jews were in Khaybar and it was a very strong place because it had so many fortresses and the Jews had all their weaponry, all their goods, all their uh, 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 wealth in these village and in these fortresses and it had a lot of farms so it was a rich village. What were the events that took place? This is all inshallah what we will find next time we meet. Until then fi amanillah wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.